Hello, welcome back to the Eternal Possibility Hour. My name is Esther Piszczek, and I am very excited to be talking with Joe Villardo today, who is a certified life coach. And let's meet him. Hello, Hello Esther. Hi. Thank you so much for talking with me today. Oh, well, thank, thank you so much for the offer. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. So you are a certified life coach and you came to being a life coach in a really interesting way. And I'm wondering if you could share that with us. Uh, sure. Um, you know, where do you start? I, I had been um, involved with uh, drugs like alcohol for almost my entire life and I started in my mid teens and went all the way up until, uh, well, until I, saw a life coach just uh, about three and a half, four years ago. And yeah, so I, I've got a lot of experience um, and I, I really needed to do something about it. And I have tried a lot of different things over the years, um, but it wasn't until I met with uh, a life coach that I was able to put it all together and put it behind me. In fact, I was so impressed with the, the process that I went through that I felt compelled to learn everything that I could and then share it with other people so that they could um, have the same benefit that I've had. And, and so that's why I got involved with life coaching. I wanted to help people that are just like me. Wow. And what was different about life coaching for you? And what are the things, just, just tell us just briefly, like what are the things did you try that hadn't worked for you or maybe only worked briefly? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, you know, for a while I didn't try anything because I didn't think it was a problem. But as things started to progress, um, I started to believe that maybe I did have a problem and I still didn't do anything. And then it was when it became readily apparent that I needed to do something that I tried. Um, well, traditional therapy with a, a psychiatrist for a little while. Um, and at one point he had referred me he wasn't really sure if my problem was depression or drug addiction or both. And what ended up happening, and this is when I was just 20 years old, he recommended that I go into a, a rehab program, a 28 day inpatient rehab program. So I tried that. And then in the process of being in the rehab, um, I learned about Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, Narcotics Anonymous. In fact, there were meetings that were held weekly there at the facility uh, where all the People that were in the rehab with me went to them that needed to go to them. There was also gambling addicts and they had their own meeting. Um, but uh, we would go to the AA and to the NA meetings and there was people from the outside that would also come in. So I was introduced to that too um, through through the rehab. But um, and I had tried different kinds of therapy. I tried uh, meditation and yoga. Um, I experienced um, a little bit with learning about um, a medium and and um, those kind of things, but nothing really brought it all together in a way that made sense to me um, and explained it to me um, until I met with a life coach. And I think the really big difference between what life coaching teaches you and and what everything else was was teaching me, which is is that um, control is really within you. It's within the thoughts that you choose. Um, where everything else that I would been taught was that there were these circumstances that happened and you need to distance yourself from these things. Like, I mean, that's one of AA's main mantras is that you need to distance yourself from the person, from the people, places, and things that influence you. And, and there was a lot of other things that they said too, that I disagreed with. And some that I also, you know, agreed with too, but that was really the big difference for me was that. Um, life coaching puts the control back in your hands, whereas most of these other forms of therapy um, don't. And how does it do that? Well, it, it simply does it by explaining to you what can, what determines your 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 feelings and your actions. Um, so, in the when we apply what they teach to um, drinking, you learn that your uh, urges and cravings or your desire for alcohol and the action of you actually drinking is completely within your control. And that control comes from the thoughts that you're choosing to think. 
um, it's not from the circumstances, it's from what you choose to think about those circumstances. And that's the biggest difference is that it puts the control back in your hands. And that was always the biggest issue that I had, not just with uh, different forms of therapy, but with my own life. It felt like everything that was causing me to feel uncomfortable was outside of my control. Uh, I didn't realize that all those things had been in my control all along. And again, it's because of the thoughts that I can choose about those things. Okay, so let's talk about control for a moment. Because when I hear the words control, and especially when we're talking about an addiction or something that becomes an addiction, it seems to me that the like the visual comes of white knuckling it through, like control, keep control. And yeah. I don't think that's what you're talking about. So can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, so what you're talking about with white knuckling it or using willpower, what you're doing there is you're trying to resist or avoid um, your your urges and desires. And what life coaching teaches you is that you don't have to avoid or resist them. You can eliminate them completely by changing the thoughts that create them. So that idea that you need to white knuckle it and 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 force your way to this place of sobriety um, is is flawed, in my opinion. Uh, you don't have to avoid or resist anything. You just need to understand the thoughts that you're choosing that are creating that thing that you're trying to avoid. And then you challenge and change the thoughts that you have to something that doesn't create that same urge that you, so you, there isn't anything to avoid. So do you, can you give me an example? Yeah, I can totally give you an example. In fact, um, I, I don't, I don't have cravings or urges to drink anymore. Now we, a lot of times in, in Alcoholics Anonymous and, and other forms of therapy, they'll talk about these triggers that you have. Now a trigger could be a friend that you used to drink with, or it could be a bar or some place that you used to go. Um, for me, a trigger might've been in the past before I learned this stuff, it would be just seeing alcohol or seeing someone drink. And that would start these thoughts in my head that would bring these urges on. Um, you, know, I, you know, my thought would be, I want that, you know, I want to have that because I want to feel, you know, that what it creates, but I don't have those urges anymore because I don't have those same thoughts anymore. Now it takes some work to do at first, some deliberate thinking, and we're not talking about lifting buildings. We're just talking about having a thought, right? I mean, how hard is it to have a thought? Yes, you have to do it deliberately. And yes, you have it takes some conscious awareness of what you're going through. But we're really just talking about choosing a thought. So it's not, it's difficult and it isn't difficult. It's both. But what I think now when I see alcohol or if I saw an old drinking buddy or went into a bar was, or what I think now is, I don't, I don't want that. I don't want to be hung over anymore. I, I know some things maybe that that person who's consuming that doesn't know. And boy, I'd like to help them and tell them if they're interested. But for me, you know, I just don't want to go there anymore. Like my, my thoughts and, and it took some deliberate work, like I said at first, but now I've, because I've thought it over these new thoughts that I have, and there's, there's many different examples of thoughts. There's like a whole array of them, but the idea that I don't want to be hung over anymore because I thought that particular thought and these others enough times, they've replaced the old subconscious thoughts that I used to have about alcohol, like alcohol makes me happy or alcohol helps me relax. I don't have those. like, And I don't have to put any effort into thinking those thoughts now. They just come to me automatically when I see a bottle of booze or see somebody drinking, if that makes sense to you. It totally makes sense. And, yeah. and I think <clears throat> as humans, we think a lot of thoughts and we don't know where those thoughts come from. And we don't even know sometimes that we're thinking those thoughts because they're so habitual that they just mm. become beliefs. They just become truths in our mind and challenging those truths can sometimes be really difficult. So how do you deal with that? Or how did you deal with that? Well, I actually I put together, I, I deal with it just like you said, like taking one step at a time, understanding what the first, the triggering thought is, and then how to counter it. And I move in believable thought steps from where I am to where I want to be, which is to say that you don't go from, from um, 
the thought that creates the urge to the thought that completely eliminates it. Like you might need to take some steps and find some neutral ground first. The thought that's easy, like it needs to be believable. Like the first thought might be like, what well, you know, maybe I can, maybe I can not drink before you come to the conclusion, you know, and the thought that, you know, I don't, I'm never going to drink again. You know, like you might want to do it in small steps. Sometimes it's possible to do in one big step, but I actually have a program that helps people eliminate the most common subconscious beliefs that we have. And there's so many of these beliefs that, uh, that we just unconsciously adopt. I mean, we're, we're like programmed with them from things that we see in the movies or on TV and in commercials, uh, things that people say to us in our own experience that we have a whole array of thoughts that make it very difficult to quit drinking if you haven't addressed them. And they're simple thoughts like alcohol makes me happy. Alcohol helps me relax. Alcohol helps me sleep or I need to drink to fit in or quitting drinking is hard. Like there's all these things that that we believe that influence our behavior um, that we're not really aware of until we take a minute to look for them. And what I do is help people not only identify them, but challenge and change them. And that's what we do in the Boost Busters uh, seven day challenge. Can you tell me a little bit about that program? Yeah, it's it's just like I said, it's, it's a process of identifying, challenging and changing the most uh, common subconscious beliefs. Uh, it's a seven day challenge. Uh, we address the six biggest beliefs, which I just enumerated for you. I think I got all six. And then there's um, uh, two days of group coaching, too, that we do at the end. And and I, I think it's an excellent starting point, because if you believe if you believe that alcohol makes you happy, what is the opposite of that? And the opposite would be quitting is going to make me miserable. Well, how much effort, consistent effort? And focus and attention are you going to put into quitting if you believe that you're going to be miserable as a result of quitting? That's why it's so important to eliminate those common subconscious thoughts so you can get those obstacles out of your way because it's really hard to quit if you think that you're not going to sleep good, if you're going to lose all your friends and not fit in, or you're, uh, you know, that alcohol helps you when you're lonely, sad, or angry. Like you need to knock those down before you can really move forward. Yeah, and I think that's a process of challenging those belief statements and really looking at them to see, is this true? Yeah, that's really the, the, the super interesting thing is, is that we adopt these beliefs um, and then we don't question them. And when you take the time to really to look at a belief closely, any one of those beliefs, it's not hard to see that what you thought was is absolutely wrong, that it's doesn't make you happy. And there's just so much evidence that anyone that's having an issue with drinking can point to that proves that the opposite of what they subconsciously believe is actually true. So changing these really isn't hard. It's just that you need to identify them and then take a few minutes to think about it. And, and you'll be surprised at what happens. Yeah, you did. Um, when I was researching for this interview, I saw you saw or heard because you, you have a blog, you've got YouTube videos, you have a lot of information that's free out there for people to access. And in one, you were talking about beer commercials and kind of like mm -hmm. the, the falsity behind those. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, it's what do you see when you see a beer commercial? I mean, they're all pretty much the same. Happy, drinking, you got a girl. You got, or yeah, there's the suggestion of romance. It's always a party. Maybe it's on a rooftop where you're relaxing on the beach. You know, these so what do you what do you think or what do you subconsciously um, uh, put into your subconscious when you observe these kind of scenes? You know, your favorite you know, rap star or whatever is sitting on the beach underneath, uh, the, you know, the shade of a palm tree enjoying his favorite beverage, alcoholic beverage. And you're like, well, yeah, like I, I can if I get one of those, I'll be able to relax, too, and, and, and maybe even be cool and fit in, you know, and. Or I can enjoy the rooftop party and maybe there'll be a, you know, the, the, it's all subconscious messages in order to sell a product. A product, by the way, and a lot of people don't know this, a product, by the way, which is a toxic poison that's proven to cause cancer. And it's amazing to me, but somehow the alcohol lobby 
has been able to market their product. This is the only cancer causing product that you can find in the marketplace that doesn't have a warning label on it. And that's because of the alcohol lobby, but it's been known since 1985, it's been proven. It causes all different forms of cancer, including breast cancer and everything from throat cancer, stomach cancer, digestive, and so on. It's, it's a toxic, so in fact, it's the same toxic substance this ethanol is what the, the type of alcohol that we drink. Next time you're at the gas station, read what's also included in the gas that you're putting in your car. It's the same thing that you're drinking. It's it's toxic and it's bad for you. I don't know how they can get away with not having to put that on their labels, but they don't. Instead, what you see are the commercials that we were just talking about. Yes, and then what you also said in the in the little blurb that I'm referencing is that you said, what's the flip side? So what happens after yeah. the guys want to breach? So if you're yeah. drinking excess, some people can just have a drink and it's just a drink, right? But some people take it to an extreme or use it to numb their thoughts or feelings about what's happening in their life. And then, so what happens next? That they're not yeah. showing you in that commercial. Yeah, they don't, and they don't show you. And I also should caution people too. One, one, just one drink is guaranteed to disrupt your sleep for the night. Well, like like you said, there are a lot of people that that don't abuse alcohol. Certainly not to the level that I was, and the level a lot of other people are. But that's not to say. Like it's the question becomes, and I find this a really interesting question. How, like this idea of drinking responsibly. Well, how much? How responsible? What level of alcohol or how much alcohol can you drink knowing that it's a toxic poison and do that in a responsible way? I mean, is there a level of toxic poison that's okay to ingest? Because, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you're certainly free to think anything that you want to think. And I wouldn't tell you a thought that you're thinking is wrong, but someone like myself who coaches people and who's exposed to all this information, I mean, that's a question that pops in my head is, you know, what how much poison can you consume responsibly is is that even a responsible act at all and i have to say in my opinion it isn't but if you want to drink you certainly can yeah well that really puts a different spin on the entire thing you know we words have meaning and we bring the meaning to the words right and so poison is a really strong word and it's actually true if you soak something in alcohol if you put a frog in alcohol it will die <laughs> yeah. right. there's an interesting experiment that that proves it they put uh, a dish of alcohol in a cage with a mouse and a mouse won't uh, they might smell it and they might taste it but they will not drink it so the question is is that i guess that mouse isn't watching the same commercials that we're watching right because I mean, it's it's a toxic poison and your instinct, even if you could if you can remember back to the very first time you even tasted alcohol, um, more than likely your response was the natural response that your body should have, which is, you know, this is terrible. It's it, especially if it was something that wasn't really diluted, like a, a beer or something that wasn't flavored with a lot of sugars, your body reacts to it, your taste buds in your body the first time that you consume alcohol, react to it in a way that's quote unquote normal. It's the way it's supposed to be, which is no, like don't drink this. This is really bad for you. But what happens is we're seeing all these other social cues all around us and these commercials and so forth that you know we should be enjoying this. So the two things don't really match up. And what happens for a lot of us is that we try it again. And maybe this time it is watered down enough, like it is beer or it's it's something that's it's it has a lot of sugars mixed into it or whatever. And we're able to drink enough to get that euphoric kick. And that's all it takes for some people. You're off to the races. Yeah. So you have a lovely little um, freebie on your site called 16 tips. Yeah. So talk to me about those 16 tips. Well, they're, um, I really like them because they're thought-based tips. Like most of the tips that you see are uh, action-based tips, like uh, get the alcohol out of your house, um, you know, like to distance yourself from the people, places, and things, and those kind of those kind of tips. Well, these are thought-based tips, and I think that actually changing your thoughts is the most effective thing that you can do. 
So uh, I put together a list of 16 tips that are thought-based that help you jumpstart your, your journey to sobriety and make it easier. Okay, so one of those that I really love, um, well, it starts out with, um, once you make your decision to quit, never question it. Yeah. Yeah, is that, is that hard? Well, I, I think it is for, for um, a lot of people, it can be hard, but I think it's all about setting your mindset um, from the get-go. I mean, that's the idea behind the tip is that, you know, you, you're making a decision, we'll make it. You know, like a lot of people will waver back and forth and that wavering back and forth, it's not gonna produce the result that you want if in fact you'd really do wanna quit. So making the decision and sticking to it and not looking back is is um, important to be able to move forward because you're not gonna you're not gonna make progress forward if you're looking backwards. Yeah, that once you make that commitment, everything flows from that. But until you actually decide, there's no reason for anything to change in your life. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. kind of locks you it locks you in and gets you moving in the direction that you really want to go. Yeah. So that one combined with um, think of yourself as a healthy, alcohol-free non-drinker from day one. I think those two really go beautifully together. Yeah. Yeah, they do. It's, it, and it is, it's all a mindset. It's, um, that's, that's all of what life coaching is, is really changing the way that you're thinking. Or another way to say it is to change your mindset about yourself and about alcohol. And those two tips are really move you forward in a in a in a big way, and sometimes they're not easy. Um, but then again, it's it's a thought, right? We're not lifting buildings. But it's just changing the way that you're thinking about yourself and about alcohol, and that can make all the difference. It does make all the difference. And then you talk about a really fantastic concept called "be, do, have, and have, do, be." So, what mm -hmm. is that all about? Well, that falls directly in line with those two tips is that you want to be the person that you want to become so you can do the things that that kind of person does and then have what they have. And most people approach life and stopping drinking from the other way around. They believe that they um, have to have the things that a non-drinker would have in order to be able to do what they do and then um be that type of person, but that's backwards thinking. You need to start by believing that you're that person at the get-go, and then you'll be able to do the things that they do and have what they have. Yeah, that's, that's a really wonderful little equation to kind of navigate what you're doing and, and a way to check in with yourself to say, hey, how am I navigating my life? What am I doing? Am I just doing all the things? Am I just wanting to have all those things or associating with people who I think have all those things. Yeah. That's that's a lot of times cool. people will um, take the actions of a non-drinker or, I mean, you can apply be, do, have to anything in your life. You're building a business or, or stopping drinking or whatever it might be. And they think that if I do the actions of a non-drinker or of a successful entrepreneur, then I'll, I'll be able to have what they have. But taking action from a place of non-belief doesn't produce the results. You're going to get the results of the things that you believe, regardless of the actions that you're taking. It's, it's kind of, um, we talk, you know, about the equation and that's kind of like trying to do the action steps where the thought is actually something different than, than what should be producing those actions. So you don't, you don't actually end up with the result that you're looking for. Like there's no way to really trick your yourself you can't do enough actions to trick yourself into actually believing that you could be this thing you have to adopt a belief of the thing or the person that you want to become in order to be able to take the actions that will produce it and you don't need to believe that it's a done deal or anything but you need to believe enough like believe maybe that it's possible or to believe that you could do this but if you're believing the opposite you know that i can't do it i won't ever be sober i won't ever be a successful entrepreneur and that's like that's really what's in your mindset then any actions that you take in the long run they're not going to produce the result that you're looking for yeah so i think i've seen it in my own life how there are these 
thought loops and I didn't realize before they were thought loops, but there'll be circumstances in my life and they keep coming back around. And every time I deal with it, I think, well, that's the end of that. I'm not going to have to deal with that again. And then it comes around again. And it's like, huh, why, <laughs> why is this back here? And I think you, that that kind of same thing, it seems is similar to what happens when you're in an alcoholic kind of spiral, you, you know, to go to the rehab and like, oh, okay, now I'm done. And, you know, I go to AA now I'm done. Oh no, no, I've made this like, vow to myself or to my partner, now I'm done. And yet those same thoughts are still the same thoughts about what you're thinking about drinking from the perspective of an alcoholic are still there. And so even though you're taking these action steps, that underlying is kind of like self-programming is still like running under the surface and then bringing you back to that same place of kind of crisis over and over again. Yeah, it's really interesting how the universe continues to bring you things that you need. Uh, you might not want them, but I, there's a lesson there that you haven't learned yet. So the universe is bringing you back into the same circumstances. It's telling you, hey, listen, uh, we've got a little more work to do in this area. So it keeps gifting you with a repeat of those circumstances so you can learn them. Yeah, and I think looking at it as the gift so mm. you talk about in your 16 steps, you have a beautiful PDF, you've got a really great video, and we're going to link to that for people so that they can access that free and free valuable information. I think the biggest thing about the tips that you should remember is that the idea of their, them being thought-based versus action-based, action, action based. Um, that's really the difference between everything that I do in life coaching and in my programs is that taking actions without belief behind it and without changing your thoughts is, is well, you could try it, but you'll find that it's pointless, which is just what we were talking about. You really need to change the belief um, that you have about yourself and the belief that you have about alcohol or whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. And you really need to work on changing those beliefs in order to produce the result that you're looking for. And then the actions that you take will be congruent you know, and they'll allow you um, to make the progress that you want. I think that's the biggest thing about, about the 16 tips is they get you thinking in the right direction is what I like to say. Yes, definitely. And so you mentioned the equation and what mm -hmm. we're talking about is the equation of emotion. And so can you just briefly take us through that, introduce it for people? Sure. Um, it's got to be, the, uh, it is the most powerful mind management tool there is. And it just, basically breaks down anything and everything that you go through into different uh, components. Everything starts with a circumstance. And a circumstance, another word for circumstance would be a fact. It's the life events that we experience. And these things are, you know, they're neutral. They have no meaning until we choose a thought about them. And that's the next part of the equation of emotion. The thoughts we choose are our opinion or interpretation of the circumstances or the facts that we experience. That's how we give meaning to our life is by our thoughts. These thoughts, when you have a thought, that thought automatically produces a feeling or an emotion. And those are one word descriptions for everything from happy to sad and everything in between. Now, the emotion that you feel drives the actions that you take actions or inaction, like not doing something is also an action. Um, and the actions that we take produce the results that we get. And that's basically in a, in a nutshell what the equation is, but it's a way for you to take the events of your life and break them down so you can see where control lies. And as I said, the control is always in the thoughts that you're thinking, but interesting, thing about our life experiences is that we most often, most of the time, we'll skip right past the thought. And what we notice is how we're feeling. But the equation, if you just started at the feeling or the emotion line and wrote that down, uh, you write down, you know, what it is that was what you were feeling at that time. And then you can also separate out what the circumstances were. And then you could ask yourself, what is it that I was thinking? about that particular circumstance that produced the emotion that I'm feeling, what actions came from it and what's the result. And it allows you to really objectively look at what you were experiencing, what you're thinking, feeling, and doing, and then break it down in a way where if you want to change it, you can, because now you can see what created everything. 
Yeah, I love that because I think it makes it more concrete when you can visually see it and write it down in a really simple format with just those, you know, simple steps. Um, and when you're just kind of doing it in your head and it's this amorphous type of thing, this like invisible thing, these thoughts are invisible things. Um, it's a lot more difficult to kind of snare the ones that are not helping you and grab onto the ones that actually will be helping you. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting too. There's a um, wonderful thing that happens when you put it down on paper is that you've literally taken it out of your head and now there's some distance between you and the experience or the thought or the emotion or whatever it is that you're focusing on. And that distance allows for some object, objectivity. You know, you're able to look at it and not feel so attached to it, which allows you to explore alternative ways of thinking and feeling. Um, uh, my wife is also a life coach that, that you know very well, and her method um, focuses around actually drawing or doing doodles of, of the emotions that you're feeling, which is another excellent way of taking it out of your head and putting it down on a piece of paper to create that distance and allow some some change to occur. Because when it's stuck in your head, you 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 identify with it. It's you know, it's not just this event; it's this event that belongs to me, this thing that I thought and did or felt, and uh, we get defensive. And but putting it on paper allows you to put the guard down. You know, to take the gate down and allows you to see it in ways that are new that might produce produce results that are more benef beneficial to you. And yeah. that's, that's a big advantage of the equation. Yeah. And I think also it really helps us to realize that I am not my thoughts hmm. when they're just in my head and they're my own private universe up there doing whatever they're doing, running amok and being crazy and chaotic, chaotic. And I think that nobody else knows what's going on in there. It can really be very isolating and putting them on paper and saying, oh, these are, they're really, they're just thoughts. Yeah, they're yeah. like, there's nothing big or scary or crazy about them. It's just a thought. And it's a thought that I have. And therefore it's a thought that I can change and I can choose a new thought. Yeah, it's an excellent tool. There's so many different levels to it. Um, and there's another part that I really enjoy or I found ex extremely helpful. Um, it may have been actually the most helpful thing um, for me to, to stop drinking, which is just the sheer act. Once you understand what each line really means and represents, the sheer act of separating the circumstances from your thoughts about them is incredibly powerful because we have a tendency to mix the two together, uh, which is exactly what I was doing. I could give you the example um, from my past that was causing me so much trouble. And when I finally separated the circumstances from my thoughts, um, it changed, it literally changed everything in my life. Um, the, the, when I was younger, there was a lot of different reasons I drank, but they basically all centered around one thing. At least this is how it started. And then there was a lot of drinking and a lot of reasons that supported my original reason. But in the beginning, um, it, it was basically, we. I'll tell you how I looked at it before I learned about, about life coaching. So I, I looked at it like we moved a lot when I was a kid and the moving sucked and being the new kid in school was terrible. And I turned to drugs like alcohol in order to distance myself from those uncomfortable emotions. But what I learned through life coaching is how to separate the circumstance of what happened from my thoughts about it. Now, the circumstance, when you really, like a circumstance is neutral, right? It has no meaning. But I was attaching all kinds of meaning to the way I viewed moving. But when you really break down what I, happened when I was younger, was I moved from A to B when I was three and B to C when I was seven and C to D when I was 11 and D to E when I was 15 and E to F when I was 19, right? That's really how you how the circumstance should be stated, the circumstance that quote unquote made me drink, right? And then everything after that was in my control. And the equation showed me that once I was able to separate the circumstance out from my thoughts, my thought that that moving sucks wasn't a fact. It was a thought that I chose about moving. And because I chose that thought, I felt terrible. 
And I drank to suppress that feeling. The, the thought that being the new kid sucks, that's not a fact. That's a thought that I chose. And I chose a bunch of other ones about, about moving to, you know, from my father doesn't love me to I'm not important to all these other things. It was this very involved story that I was telling myself that led to me drinking. And I was constantly adding to my story and adding evidence that I that the story I was telling myself was true. But once a life coach showed me that, hey, look, this is the circumstance and you could choose any thought you want to about it. And why did you choose that thought? You know, you ask yourself questions like that really opens your mind up to like what really happened. Esther is just so, so it's so um, with me every day. Like I think about this all the time. What really happened was it dawned on me that what my life coach was telling me is true. And my first feelings about it were shame and regret. She, she asked me, she could see like something visibly had changed in my emotions. She said, what's going on? I was like, I can't believe that I did this to myself. Like, I really believe, like, I get it. You know, these thoughts I chose created 30 years of misery and pain and suffering for me and for my, like, what is wrong with me, you know, that I did this? And then she said, well, hold on a second. She said, I had very similar thought. She said, I realized that that I alone was the cause of all my pain and suffering and everything that happened. But along with believing that comes another truth. If you do believe that and you believe you caused all your pain and suffering, then you alone are the one and only solution to your pain and suffering too. And that was like, boom, you're right. And that's, that's the thought that changed everything for me. That's where it started. Yeah, that's really powerful because the equation brings you down to, you know, circumstance, thoughts, emotions, actions, results, and the result is always tied back to your thought. It's not mm -hmm. tied back to the emotion. It's not tied back to the circumstance. And so on your site, you also, in that video, you talk about um, things that make you drink the beer in my fridge. The beer in your fridge is a fact. There is a beer in my fridge, but that's it. There's nothing else tied to that until you get to, oh, the commercial tells me that beer is going to make me happy. And then it cascades from there. Yeah, beer in your fridge can't make you do something. You know, like it doesn't have any power or control over you. You have all the power and control. And just like you said, it comes from what you choose to think about that. And yeah, we are pre-programmed with, with different things. You know, it's going to make me happy and so forth. But you can change that programming. And, and you can take back control. You don't have to be subject to these subconscious beliefs and these ideas that are being pushed out all, all around you, all around every day. I mean, they're out there all the time. Yeah. And I think that once we start to question what we're actually thinking and whether or not, whether those thoughts are actually true, then it really opens up an entire new world about your, like everything, everything you're experiencing. Then you start seeing kind of the lies and the untruths and the buried thoughts within the programming everywhere you go. But until you actually open your mind to the possibility that there are things you are not seeing and not understanding, then it's all like you're blindfolded. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because you had um, we had talked a little bit before we started recording. And that's actually the silver lining behind all of this is that what I've learned from um, from using the equation to help myself with stopping drinking and taking all the other drugs that I was taking too, is that I now have this tool that I apply to everything every day. Like I, I did this. I'm not talking about you know something I learned four years ago, and that's when I use it, and I don't use it anymore. I used it today already. You know, I used it before getting ready to talk to you, and I used it last night at dinner. And you know, you use the the equation helps you with everything in your life. And it helps you understand how to make things better, how to get rid of discomfort, how, you know, all these different things. And you can apply it to every single circumstance that you experience, no matter what it is. And that's really, that's the biggest gift that I received along with getting rid of, you know, all this other junk that I was doing with the drinking and the, the other drugs. And but, but the silver lining is now I have a tool where I can manage my mind 
and I apply it to my family. I apply it to everything that I'm doing and thinking I'm, you know, building a business or, 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 you know, with my wife, it doesn't matter. You know, like this tool is universal and it can help you with so many things, you know, starting with alcohol is a great place to start, but you're going to be gifted something that's going to help you with, with every single aspect of your life when you learn how to use this. Yeah. I love that. I love that. It, what you're talking about is really you teach people how to coach themselves so that they no longer need to pay somebody else or go somewhere else or see a therapist. I mean, therapy is fantastic. And if that is still helpful, that is wonderful. Absolutely. Um, but you're really giving, you know, they say, give a man a fish, but teach him to teach him to fish and then he can get his own fish. Right. So you're actually teaching people how to manage their minds to uncover their, the buried thoughts in there that are creating <clears throat> the results that they don't want and helping them to choose really a new life. Yeah. That's a wonderful thing to be in a position to do that. Um, and that's exactly, I mean, you, I couldn't have said it better. That's exactly what the objective is, is, is to give someone the opportunity to, to take control back of their life, no matter what it is and, and what they're experiencing. And the equation is the, the tool that allows you to do it. Once you understand the basic components and how to use it um, and you, you know, you practice, uh, it does take some time, but it, you can, you, anybody can figure it out. The concepts aren't really difficult. It's just that no one's ever explained to you like why you, in fact, in fact, we do the exact opposite. We teach our children and I was taught and you probably taught the same thing too. The things that people say to us early in our development um, and even later in life are directly opposed to what the actual truth is. When you say to Sally, you know, did little Timmy hurt your feelings? What are you really teaching Sally? You're teaching her that Timmy is controlled in control of the way that she feels. And that's wrong. I mean, that's not the way of it. Um, so this tool gives you the ability to take back the control and understand what's really happening. You know, there's a thought in between uh, the circumstance and the emotion you're feeling, and you can choose any thought that you want to. It doesn't matter what little Timmy does. Little Sally can think any way that she wants to about it and feel any way that she wants to feel. That's the point of all this. Yeah, it's really empowering. So do you have, you've shared your story, which is like miraculous and fabulous. Um, do you have uh, another story from one of your clients maybe that you could share with us that really um, shows the arc of somebody's journey through this process of working with you and understanding these concepts? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think what you what you see, what I what I notice with my clients, and this just happened with a client that uh, I was working with a couple months ago. I got an email from him last week. He had been um, he had been really active in um, mountain climbing and hang gliding and and whitewater kayaking. He was a big into the outdoor sports. And about five years ago, he decided to give that up because it was taking up too much of his time. And he wanted to spend more time with his wife and his child. And through a long story, he started to drink more. Like he, he kind of replaced what he was doing with that and, and it got out of control. And he, he got separated and his, his uh, child wasn't talking to him anymore. And we started to work together and um and i see this not just i saw this not just with him but i see it with with all my clients it's just like a light bulb suddenly goes off in their head when they get it and it might be the first session it might be a couple sessions in but but something happens where they they get it and then they start to apply the equation to their lives and and it it changes for them that's like one of the most rewarding things is to see what happened to me happened to somebody else. And it's that light bulb moment where they piece it all together and understand, oh my goodness, I really have control over all of this, over everything. Mm -hmm. And that happened with this individual and he just had sent uh, an email just to give me an update on how things were going and they're going much better than they were. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's fun to see people make progress. That light bulb moment is something that I get to, get to see uh, 
Um, I'd like to see more of it, but when I do get to see it, I, I really enjoy it. And, um, uh, you know, I don't always keep in, in, in contact with the people that I work with. Um, you know, occasionally I'll get emails and, and get some updates here and there. Um, it's fun to watch the progress occur during the sessions that we're having. Um, and it's always great to hear about the progress that they've made, you know, even six months or a year or two or down the road. Um, so that's just that's just one example. But it, for me, the biggest reward is certainly seeing when somebody gets it. Yeah, that must be really fantastic. I mean, so satisfying that you did something to help somebody change their life in such a meaningful way. And not only change their life, but you're not even just changing their life, you're changing the life of everybody who's in a relationship with them. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like alcohol... Um, alcohol doesn't just affect the person that's drinking and it affects everyone, like you said, everyone around them and, and, and quitting, like drinking affects every part of your life. So when you, when you take back control and you, you cut back or quit, every part of your life is impacted too. So it's, it's um, yeah. Helping people with this is what is why I'm here. That's, that's why I'm here and what I do. Yeah, that's wonderful. So have you seen this approach work with other, you talked a little bit about um, people with other types of problems in their lives. Have you either worked with anybody or seen it help anybody else? So suppose somebody's watching, they're like, all right, well, I don't have a problem with alcohol, but you know, I just, I overeat, I stress eat, or I, you know, I just can't stop eating sugar or I exercise nonstop. Is, does this help with any of those issues? Do, in your experience? Yeah, yeah, it absolutely does. In fact, early on, um, I received a referral. Um, it was, I worked with this, this one woman who was an attorney and she worked, um, she explained that, you know, she was putting on weight and she wanted to stop overeating. And we talked and she explained that she was, um, that she would reward herself with candy after either a hard day or hard week's worth of work. And, and we talked about it a little bit and she specifically said, she's like, yes, yeah, you know, after working all day or for the week or whatever, I like to reward myself with, um, you know, some milk chocolate, or I don't even remember exactly what it was, but it was candy. And, um, and we talked more and, you know, she felt a lot of shame about it. She wasn't happy with the weight that she was gaining. She didn't like the way that she looked. She was concerned about her health. But at the same time, she said, I like to reward myself and give myself a treat. And, and I asked her, there was just one question that really turned it for her. I asked her, I said, is it really a reward and a treat for you to have candy after a hard day or hard week's worth of work if you beat yourself up afterwards? And so that was one of the, the one uh, conversation that we had. And then the next session, we got back together and she's like, you've ruined it for me. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? She said, I can't eat candy anymore. Every time I do, I pick it up and I think, I think about the thought that you said, and you're so right. It's not a treat. I had been telling myself that it was, but it's not a reward and I'm done. So yes, I have worked with other people, um, you know, with overeating and, and sugary foods and other drugs too, you know, cigarettes also, you know, nicotine is a drug. Um, but yeah, and this, it's the same principles, right? It's this, it's all the same strategy and the same principles. It's the thoughts that you're choosing to think um, are what create your urges and cravings. And they're the reason that they, you take the action of consuming whatever it is that you consume. So it doesn't really matter what what the the thing is whether it's porn or um like cigarettes or salty foods or alcohol or whatever you know it's you know there's there's a thought that you're thinking about it that's creating the the urge or desire that you feel to engage in that behavior and you just need to take a look at what those thoughts are and then ask yourself if they're really true or is there another way to think about this that doesn't produce that action and or that feeling in that action and yeah so yeah I do work with other people 
Um, my main focus has been uh, alcohol. I wanted to concentrate in one area to, to focus my messaging and be the most effective that I can be. But yeah, it applies to applies to anything that you can think of. Yeah, that's so wonderful. So you are rolling out some new programs in January to help people. Can you tell us about those and how people get involved? Sure. Um, the the programs I'm running out, or we mentioned the boost, uh, we might have mentioned the Boost Buster Seven Day Challenge, where we challenge and change the the six most common uh, beliefs you have that lead to the drinking you do. Uh, it's a one week program um, where we we challenge and change the. It turns out to be the six most common beliefs, uh, and then there's two uh, group coaching sessions that we have at the end of the week where you can bring up anything that you like, or if you're having trouble changing a particular belief, or you've come up with a new belief and you want to challenge and change it. And then during the course of the program, you get the belief buster technique that you can you'll learn it. You'll get a written copy of it also, and then you'll be able to apply it to whatever belief that you come up with afterwards. So that's the booze busters challenge, and you can find. Um, I guess you said you'll link to it. I'll just leave it to that. You, you, um, you can find it at choosenewthoughts.com forward slash booze busters. Um, but that's, that's the, that's the, uh, the one program which leads into the take control program, which is actually a six week, a more intensive program where I teach about the equation that we talked about and how to use it. Uh, you learn more about urges, uh, what creates them, what are the three responses that you have, what's the run response choice that you can make that will actually lead to the urges becoming um, less frequent and less intense. Uh, you learn about cognitive dissonance. Um, there's a whole bunch of things. It's, it's a more intensive program uh, that really focuses mainly on urges and also the equation. And that too includes um, uh coaching, group coaching, and both of those programs come with the option of, of getting the VIP package where you can actually get some one-on-one -on -one coaching too at a, a dramatically reduced rate. And do you also just do private coaching with people outside of those programs? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also do just the private coaching. Mm -hmm. And you can find, if you're interested in learning more about the private coaching, you can go to uh, choosenewthoughts.com forward slash work dash with dash me and sign up for a free consultation call. And I wanted to, to make sure to, um, to mention that Esther, for your listeners, if anyone is interested in any of the programs or the one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, the special offer for your listeners is that if you, when you sign up for the Boost Busters VIP program, which includes six one-on-one -on -one coaching calls, you'll get the take control program for free. And that's $197 uh, value. And if you're interested in that, again, go to choosenewthoughts.com forward slash work dash with dash me and make sure to mention that you saw this on the pod, saw me on the podcast, on Esther's podcast, and you're interested in participating in, in all the programs and you'll get the special discount. Oh, that's great. So what if somebody is listening to this, they're saying, all right, I am dead broke. I have no money and I really have a problem. How, what could they do? Oh, well, for sure, download the 16 tips, another address, uh, choose new, <laughs> choose new thoughts.com forward slash one six T I P S download that. And then I also do, um, a weekly broadcast on Facebook. It's Saturday morning, 11 AM central. Uh, it's every week, and that's it's totally free. And there's all all the archived or the previous shows are in the posts. You just need to scroll down. So you can join me live on Saturday, or you can go to the Choose New Thoughts um, uh, Facebook page and scroll down through the posts, and you can find all the older um, uh, or previous uh, versions of the live show that I've done. So there's lots of free resources there and there's free uh, blogs on the website. So there's, there's, and also on YouTube at Choose New Thoughts. Um, so there's plenty of free resources to choose from. Do you have a book recommendation for people? Yeah, there are a couple of uh, really good books. Um, uh, definitely Alcohol Explained by William Porter is a really good book to understand more about the effects of alcohol and what it's doing to you. That's probably the, the first book that I would start with. And then there's lots of people that have written books about quitting drinking. A couple of my favorites are 
um, This Naked Mind by Annie Grace, and then also Alan Carr, A-L-L-E-N-C-A-R-R, Alan Carr. Uh, I think they changed the title of the book, but it used to be How to Stop Drinking. If you look for Alan Carr, you'll find all kinds of tips. He's particularly good. He he helped uh, a lot of people um, stop smoking cigarettes. That's where he started. And then because these same, just as with me, the, the same principles apply to anything that you're consuming. He He's also done one that's uh, geared more towards drinking alcohol. But those are two good books. Annie Grace is particularly good also. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. I always... Mm-hmm. Love books. I think they're a wonderful way to get information. If you're not ready to engage with another human being about what's happening in your life, you can really learn a lot and make a lot of changes. Yeah. 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 Those are three good ones to choose from. Wonderful recommendations. So I'm so glad that you came to talk to me. Do you have anything, any last words that you would like to share with my listeners? Um, Yeah. Don't give up on yourself. It's easy to, to give up hope, but don't there's still there's there's still more that you can do you can change your life it doesn't have to be hard it doesn't have to be painful Um, you just need to know what the right things are if you haven't found it yet um, if AA didn't work for you if therapy didn't work for you or maybe you hadn't really tried anything yet um, it's it's okay to be where you are I don't want you to feel ashamed or broken or or that you have a disease that can't be cured or any of those things. None of those things are true. You you do have the power to change your life. And it begins with choosing a new thought. I'd love to help you. Um, if, if Go to the free resources or, you know, sign up uh, for a one-on-one coaching call or whatever it is that you want to do, but do something. You know, don't give up hope. There's always a chance that you can find the right thing or the right tool or the right person to help you. I hope it's me. All right. And if it's not, I hope you find it somewhere else, but keep trying because it's worth it. You're worth it. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I believe that a hundred percent about every human being, as long as there's a breath in the body, there's still hope and we can change our lives. And it's as easy as one thought at a time. Yeah. It's hard to believe that that's the truth, but it really, really is. It's just one thought at a time. And that one thought can change your world. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joe. This has been oh, a real talk to you. Oh, it's been such a pleasure for me too. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for asking me to come on. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye. Bye.